Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm back this week with Henry. Hi. And this week is our next presidential series installment, taking a look at who, Henry? Calvin Coolidge. That's right. And what number president is he? The 30th president of the United States. That's right. The 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. But first, before we tell you all the really good things, all the really cool things about Coolidge, what do they got to do, Henry? Hit the down down below, leave all kinds of questions, give us a thumbs up, and give us a like. That's right. So, like Henry said, subscribe down below, hit that button, likes, thumbs up, leave those comments and questions, right? Because we love the interaction with our fans, of course. And hit that little notification bell, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to notify you every time we release a new video, which Henry, when is that? Every single week. It's every single week, he's right. So now, sit back, because we're going to take a look at the 30th president of the United States, who? Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, along with... Henry. <laughs> Henry here with us. Yes, and the guy behind us is the 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. And we have some really, you know, cool things to tell you about Coolidge. Such as, his own father actually swore him in as president. Yes, he took the oath of office and his father was the one who administered it to him. Really cool, right? Yeah. And we're going to tell you all about that. Another thing that's really awesome about Calvin Coolidge, he is the only U U.S. president ever to be born on the 4th of July. Did you know that? Oh. Very cool. We've had some presidents who have died on the 4th of July, mm -hmm. but Coolidge is the only one born on the 4th of July. Yes. And last but not least, his final resting place, his grave site, may be the most humble and modest grave sites of any president we've ever had. Up in Vermont, where Coolidge was from, it is awesome. It's a roadside grave site. I'm going to show you it. One of my favorites, believe it or not. Can't wait to show it to you in the mountains of Vermont. Right, Henry? Yep. So, sit back and relax. You did the likes. You did the subscribes. Hopefully, you did those comments and questions. Mm -hmm. And Henry, take it away. What do they got to do now? Get the potato chips and soda and the popcorn and pretzels. <laughs> That's right. Potato chips, soda, popcorn, pretzels, or the planter's cheese balls, yeah. right? Henry just had planters cheese balls like I had when I was a kid. They came back out with them, and he, you love them, right? They're awesome. They're awesome. So whatever you want to snack on, get it? Because it's time to take a look in this next presidential series installment at our 30th president of the United States, the man behind us. Who is it? Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, it's Henry's Dead History. Happy Memorial Day. I hope you enjoy the parts with Calvin Coolidge. Keep it cool. Hey guys, welcome. TJ here with Dead History. And welcome to our next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. I am flying solo for my audio portion here. Uh, Henry's not with me. Uh, maybe he'll make a little guest uh, appearance, a little hello or something. But other than that, I am doing the audio alone. I did want to mention uh, two quick things uh, before we get into Coolidge. Uh, first is in our last video, our last uh, Warren Harding Part 2 video, um, there is a little bonus at the very end of the video. Uh, it was actually uh, the gravesite of Charles Forbes, the uh, man who... Harding strangled in the White House because he was so furious with him over uh, scandals. Um, I did want to just mention that to people. Sometimes, especially, I will usually mention it. But I tell you that there's going to be like a special bonus or keep your eye out for, you know, ABC type thing. Make sure that you watch to the very end because sometimes I do throw in bonus footage like that. So I did want to mention that just in case people missed it. Uh, and also, I've had some inquiries on YouTube. Um, 
This Coolidge is one of the final 11 presidents that we're doing in our presidential series. So after Coolidge, after this week, we will be down to 10 more left. Remember, I am not doing any living presidents. So Jimmy Carter, uh, George W. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, you know, all those guys, we're not doing a series on them. I'm only doing series on deceased presidents. Same as when I move forward to vice presidents. They have to be deceased in order for me to do uh, a series, you know, to do videos on them. Because the main focus, of course, dead history, <laughs> as my, uh, you know, page and everything, uh, our, our name says, you know, is really, we try to give you an overview of everything about their life, but the main focus is about their grave site or the burial site and that sort of thing, so... Just wanted to mention that one more time. Okay, so let's move right in to Calvin Coolidge and get cracking here. John Calvin Coolidge Jr. was born on July 4th of 1872 in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. The only U.S. president to be born on Independence Day, the 4th of July. He was the elder of the two children of John Calvin Coolidge Sr. and Victoria Josephine Moore. Although named for his father, John, from early childhood, Coolidge was addressed by his middle name, Calvin. His middle name was selected in honor of John Calvin, considered a founder of the Congregational Church in which Coolidge was raised and remained active throughout his life. Coolidge Sr. engaged in many occupations and developed a statewide reputation as a prosperous farmer, storekeeper, and public servant. He held various local offices, including Justice of the Peace and Tax Collector, and served in the Vermont House of Representatives as well as the Vermont Senate. Coolidge's mother was the daughter of Hiram Dunlap Moore, a Plymouth Notch farmer, and Abigail Franklin. She was chronically ill and died at the age of 39, perhaps from tuberculosis, when Coolidge was only 12 years old. His younger sister Abigail, Grace Coolidge, died at the age of 15, probably of appendicitis, when Coolidge was only 18. Coolidge's father married a Plymouth school teacher in 1891 and lived to the age of 80. Coolidge's family had deep roots in New England. His earliest ancestor, John Coolidge, emigrated from Cottingham, Cambridgeshire, England, around 1630, and settled in w Watertown, Massachusetts. Coolidge's great-great-grandfather, also named John Coolidge, was an American military officer in the Revolution Revolutionary War, and one of the first selectmen of the town of Plymouth. His grandfather, Calvin Galusha Coolidge, served in the Vermont House of Representatives. Coolidge was also a descendant of Samuel Appleton, who settled in Ipswich and led the Massachusetts Bay Colony during King Philip's War. Pretty cool stuff about Coolidge and his, uh, his background and his family. So now a little bit about his education and you know his law practice. Calvin Coolidge attended Black River Academy and then St. Johnsbury Academy before enrolling at Amherst College, where he distinguished himself in the debating class. As a senior, he joined the fraternity Phi Gamma Delta and graduated cum laude. While at Amherst, Coolidge was profoundly influenced by philosophy professor Charles Edward Garman, a congregational mystic with a neo Hegelian philosophy. Or Hegelian? Hegelian? Coolidge explained Garman's ethics 40 years later. There is a standard of righteousness that might does not make right, that the end does not justify the means, and that expendency as a working principle is bound to fail. The only hope of perfecting human relationships is in accordance with the law of service under which men are not so solicitous, solicitous about what they shall get 
as they are about what they shall give. Yet people are entitled to the rewards of their industry. What they earn is theirs, no matter how small or how great. But the possession of property carries the obligation to use it in larger service. At his father's urging after graduation, Calvin Coolidge moved to Northampton, Massachusetts to become a lawyer. To avoid the cost of law school, Coolidge followed the common practice of apprenticing with a local law firm, Hammond and Field, and reading law with them. John C. Hammond and Henry P. Field, both Amherst graduates, introduced Coolidge to law practice in the county seat of Hampshire County, Massachusetts. In 1897, Coolidge was admitted to the Massachusetts bar, becoming a country lawyer. With his savings and a small inheritance from his grandfather, Coolidge opened his own law office in Northampton in 1898. He practiced commercial law, believing that he served his clients best by staying out of court. As his reputation as a hardworking and diligent attorney grew, local banks and other businesses began to retain his services. In 1903, Coolidge met Grace Anna Goodhue, a University of Vermont graduate and teacher at Northampton's Clark School for the Deaf. They married on October 4th of 1905 at 2.30 p.m. in a small ceremony which took place in the parlor of Grace's family's house, having overcome his future mother-in-law's objections to the marriage. The newlyweds went on a honeymoon trip to Montreal, originally planned for two weeks, but cut short by a week at Coolidge's request. After 25 years, he wrote of Grace, for almost a quarter of a century, she has borne with my infirmities, and I have rejoiced in her graces. The Coolidges had two sons, John and Calvin Jr., Calvin Jr. died at the age of 16 from blood poisoning. On June 30th of 1924, Calvin Jr. had played tennis with his brother on the White House tennis courts without putting socks, without putting on socks, and he developed a blister on one of his toes. The blister subsequently degenerated into sepsis, and Calvin Jr. died a little over a week later. This is something we will also touch on a little bit in part two. The president never forgave himself for Calvin Jr.'s death. His eldest John said, said it, it hurt Coolidge terribly. John became a railroad executive and helped to start the Coolidge Foundation and was instrumental in creating the President Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site. Coolidge was frugal, and when it came to securing a home, he insisted upon renting. He and his wife attended Northampton's Edwards Congregational Church before and after his presidency. Now we're going to kind of get into a uh, local political office that he, uh, Calvin Coolidge held from 1898 through uh, 1915. City offices. The Republican Party was dominant in New England at the time, and Coolidge followed the example of Hammond and Field by becoming active in local politics. In 1896, Coolidge campaigned for Republican presidential candidate William McKinley, and the next year he was selected to be a member of the Republican City Committee. In 1898, he won election to the City Council of Northampton, placing second in a ward where the top three candidates were elected. The position offered no salary, but provided Coolidge invaluable political experience. In 1899, he declined renomination running instead for city solicitor, a position elected by the city council. He was elected for a one-year term in 1900 and re-elected in 1901. This position gave Coolidge more experience as a lawyer and paid a salary of $600, which, was the, uh, which is the equivalent to about $18,665 in this day. In 1902, the city council selected a Democrat for city solicitor, and Coolidge returned to private practice. Soon thereafter, however, the clerk of courts for the county died, 
and Coolidge was chosen to replace him. The position paid well, but it barred him from practicing law, so he remained at the job for only one year. In 1904, Coolidge suffered his sole defeat at the ballot box, losing an election to the Northampton School Board. When told that some of his neighbors voted against him because he had no children in the schools, he would govern. The recently married Coolidge replied, might give me time. <laughs> Thought that was pretty funny. <clears throat> a, little, a little funny uh, joke. Uh, one thing I did want to touch on again, Calvin Coolidge, as I said, is the only president born on the 4th of July. He was born in Plymouth Notch, July 4th of 1872, giving him the distinction of being the only president born on the 4th of July. Three of the first five presidents died on the 4th of July, but no one was ever born on the 4th of July. So there you go. And then, of course, I just kind of touched on it. Coolidge was elected to political office the same year he opened his own law firm. Coolidge was an engaged student. He graduated with honors from Amherst College in 1895, then earned his law degree. After passing the bar, he opened a firm in Northampton, Massachusetts, and in 1898, and was elected to the town city council. That modest office led to an escalating interest in politics that led to his election as governor of the state in 1918, which we're about to get into here in a minute. So now, what about the Massachusetts state legislature and mayor? In 1906, the local Republican committee nominated Coolidge for election to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. He won a close victory over the incumbent Democrat and reported to Boston for the 1907 session, session of the Massachusetts General Court. In his freshman term, Coolidge served on minor committees, and although he usually voted with the party, was known as a progressive Republican, voting in favor of such measures as women's suffrage and the direct election of senators. While in Boston, Coolidge became an ally and then a liegeman of then U.S. Senator Winthrop Murray Crane, who controlled the Western faction of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Crane's party rival in the east of the Commonwealth was U.S. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Coolidge forged another key strategic, strategic alliance with Guy Courier, who had served in both state houses and had the social distinction, wealth, personal charm and broad circle of friends which Coolidge lacked and which would have a lasting impact on his political career. In 1907, he was elected to a second term and in the 1908 ses session, Coolidge was more outspoken though not in a leadership position. Instead of vying for another term in the state house, Coolidge returned home to his growing family and ran for mayor of Northampton when the incumbent Democrat retired. He was well-liked in the town and defeated his challenger by a vote of 1,597 to 1,409. During his first term, he increased teacher salaries and retired some of the city's debt while still managing to affect a slight tax decrease. He was renominated for mayor in 1911 and defeated the same opponent by a slightly larger margin. In 1911, the state senator for the Hampshire County area retired and successfully encouraged Coolidge to run for a seat for the 1912 session. Coolidge defeated his Democratic opponent by a large margin. At the start of that term, he became chairman of a committee to arbitrate the Bread and Roses strike by the workers of the American Woolen, Co Woolen Company in Lawrence, Massachusetts. After two tense months, the company agreed to the workers' demands and a settlement proposed, proposed by the committee. A major issue affecting Massachusetts Republicans that year was the party split between the progressive wing, which favored Teddy Roosevelt, and the conservative wing, which favored William Howard Taft. Although he favored some progressive measures, Coolidge refused to leave the Republican Party. And when the new Progressive Party declined to run a candidate in his state Senate district, Coolidge won re-election against his Democratic opponent by an increased margin. 
In the 1913 session, Coolidge enjoyed renowned success in arduously navigating to passage the Western Trolley Act, which connected Northampton with a dozen similar, similar industrial communities in Western Massachusetts. College in, uh, Coolidge intended to retire after his second term, as was the custom. But when the president of the state senate, Levi H. Greenwood, considered running for lieutenant governor, Coolidge decided to run again for the Senate in the hopes of being elected as its presiding officer. Although Greenwood later decided to run re-election re to the Senate, he was defeated primarily due to his opposition to women's suffrage. Coolidge was in favor of the women's vote. With his own re-election and with Crane's help, he assumed the presidency of a closely divided Senate. After his election in January of 1914, Calvin Coolidge delivered a published and frequently quoted speech entitled, Have Faith in Massachusetts, which summarized his philosophy of government. Coolidge's speech was well received, and he attracted some admirers on its account. Towards the end of the term, many of them were proposing his name for nomination to lieutenant governor. After winning re-election to the Senate by an increased margin in the 1914 elections, Coolidge was re-elected unanimously to be president of the Senate. Coolidge's supporters, led by fellow Amherst alumni, Frank Stearns, encouraged him to run for lieutenant governor. Stearns, an executive with the Boston department store R.H. Stearns, became another key ally and began a public publicity campaign on Coolidge's behalf before he announced his candidacy at the end of the 1915 legislative session. Now, being lieutenant governor and then governor of Massachusetts, Coolidge entered the primary election for lieutenant governor and was nominated to run alongside gubernatorial candidate Samuel W. McCall. Coolidge was the leading vote-getter in the Republican primary and balanced the Republican ticket by adding a Western presence to McCall's Eastern base of support. McCall and Coolidge won the 1915 election to their respective one-year terms, and with Coolidge defeating his opponent by more than 50,000 votes. In Massachusetts, the lieutenant governor does not preside over the state Senate, as in the case in many other states. Nevertheless, as lieutenant governor, Coolidge was a deputy governor functioning as administrative inspector and was a member of the governor's council. He was also a chairman of the finance committee and the pardons committee. So, interesting stuff. Um, and basically, so McCall and Coolidge were both re-elected in 1916 and again in 1917. And when McCall decided that he would not stand for a fourth term, Coolidge denounced his intention to run for governor. And then in the 1918 election, Coolidge was unopposed for the Republican nomination for governor of Massachusetts in 1918. He and his running mate, Channing Cox, a Boston lawyer and speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, ran on the previous administration's record. Fiscal conservatism, a vague opposition to prohibition, support for women's suffrage, and support for American involvement in World War I. The issue of the war proved divisive, especially among Irish and German Americans. Coolidge was elected by a margin of 16,773 votes over his opponent, Richard H. Long, in the smallest margin of victory of any of his statewide campaigns. So there you go, then uh, he was governor. Um, in the 1919 election, Coolidge and Cox were renominated for the respective offices in 1919, and by this time, Coolidge's supporters, especially Stearns, had publicized his actions in the police strike around the state and the nation, and some of Coolidge's speeches were published in book form. Um, I'm going to get into that here in a second about the uh, police strike. Uh, this was in 1919, actually, uh, that this happened. Uh, a police strike made Calvin Coolidge a household name. In 1919, Calvin Coolidge faced his biggest challenge yet as a politician when a police strike led to panic and violence in the streets of Boston. After sending in the state guard to quell the tension, 
Calvin Coolidge admonished the officers for leaving their post. Their hardline stance impressed the public at large. That hardline stance, I should say, impressed the public at large. And by 1920, he was an easy pick for a vice presidential nomination on the Republican ticket next to presidential nominee Warren G. Harding. So, uh, interesting stuff. So, yeah, there was a police strike in 1919. Um, it was pretty big stuff. Uh, in reaction to a plan of the policemen of the Boston Police Bar uh, Department to register with a union, the police commissioner, his name was Edwin U. Curtis, announced that such an act would not be tolerated. In August of that year, the American Federation of Labor issued a charter to the Boston Police Union. Curtis declared the union's leaders were guilty of insubordination and would be, would be relieved of duty, but indicated he would cancel their suspension if the union was dissolved by September 4th. The mayor at the time of Boston, Andrew Peters, convinced Curtis to delay his action for a few days, but with no results, and Curtis suspended the union leaders on September 8th. Bottom line is, it was, it was terrible. Um... You know, Coolidge kind of sensing the severity of circumstances were then in need uh, of his intervention. Uh, he conferred uh, with Crane's operative, William Butler, and then acted. Uh, Coolidge called up more units of the National Guard and restored Curtis to office and took personal control of the police force. So as I said, he took a pretty hard stance on the uh, police strike uh, and it earned him notoriety uh, even nationally. So... And then, of course, he was uh, he was on the Republican uh, national ticket, uh, the Republican ticket in 1920. Uh, and when Warren Harding was elected, his vice presidential uh, candidate was Calvin Coolidge. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Silent Cal, as they call him. Uh, so then he was vice president. And of course, he was vice president up until Warren G. Harding died in office. And then Coolidge became the 30th president of the United States. So uh, just to read you a little more about his youth and that sort of thing. Um, he was a quiet and serious young man. John Calvin Coolidge, born July 4th of 1872 in the small village of Plymouth Notch, Vermont. His father, also named John Calvin Coolidge, was a hardworking and frugal businessman who ran a general store and post office. His mother, Victoria Josephine Moore Coolidge, died when her son was just 12 years old. And he was raised, to be honest industrious and conservative with a deep respect for business. Coolidge graduated from Black River Academy in Ludlow, Vermont in 1890 and went on to attend Amherst College in Massachusetts, graduating with honors in 1895. He studied law and passed the Massachusetts Bar Exam in 1898. After opening a law office in Northampton, Massachusetts, he spent the next 20 years handling real estate deals wills and bankruptcies. In October 4th of 1905, Calvin Coolidge married Grace Anna Goodhue, a teacher at a local school for the deaf. And they had two sons, John and Calvin Jr. Then his political career, Coolidge launched, launched his career in politics in 1898 when he was elected to the Northampton, Massachusetts City Council. He then began a quiet but methodical climb up the political ladder serving in the Massachusetts House of Representatives as mayor of Northampton, as a state congressman, as a state senator, and as lieutenant governor. During this period, Coolidge studied public policy questions, made speeches, and steadily gained influence with Republican Party leaders. He de developed a reputation as a pro-business conservative who strove to make government lean and efficient. In 1918, Coolidge was elected governor of Massachusetts. He was catapulted into the national spotlight the following year when the Boston police force went on strike and riots broke out across the city. Coolidge sent in the state guard to restore order and then took a strong stand against rehiring the striking police officers. In a telegram to labor leader Samuel Gompers, he famously declared that there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody Anywhere, anytime. Coolidge's handling of the situation captured the imagination of the American public. And as the 1920 U.S. presidential election approached, rank-and-file delegates to the Republican National Convention chose him 
as the vice presidential candidate on a ticket headed by U.S. Senator Warren G. Harding of Ohio. So there you have it. That is the young life, the birthplace, the uh, schooling and education, and then political career leading up to his vice presidential nomination of Calvin Coolidge, who, by the way, and we will hear about this in part two a little bit, he never lost an election but one. He lost one election in his entire political career. I mean, he was a fabulous politician with a superb record of winning. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, in part two, we're going to get into, of course, his presidency, his legacy, and then his death and burial site right there in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, which is awesome. I love it. One of my top favorites, believe it or not. So stay tuned for that in part two. I hope you enjoyed part one, this look at the birthplace, young life, and uh, young uh, the education and young political career of Calvin Coolidge, our 30th president of the United States, in this, our next presidential series installment. So stay tuned. Part two will be tomorrow. Thanks, as always, for everybody for the support, the questions, the comments, the likes, the subscribes. You guys are the best. Everyone out there, you name it. Uh, you guys are all awesome. I, I can't thank you enough. It seems like every uh, every week uh, I'm thanking new people or the same people, and I love it. You know, we got people like Logan. Logan is awesome. Thank you, Logan. Noah. Noah is awesome. Thank you, Noah. Les, all the way over there in England. You're the best, Les. Uh, we got Albert Matthews. Al, you're awesome, Al. Thank you. Uh, we got Paus. Uh, Paus uh, of Avito. Uh, Avito. Ivito. Uh, you're awesome. Love you. You're the best. Scott Dolan, Richard Tanner, you name it, all you guys. Thank you so much for the support. Um, Rebecca, oh, I, I, I mean, I can go on forever. Ever. You guys are just all awesome. Thank you so much. Keep it up. And we will see you tomorrow for part two. Thanks, guys.